In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Most Merciful, all praises due to Allah, Lord of all the worlds, the Beneficent, the Most Merciful, Master of Quid, in which we now live, the along we serve, the along we beseech for thine aid, O oh, Allah, guide us on the right path, the path those upon our still favors for, not the path those upon our wrath is brought down, nor those who go astray. I mean. I greet you in peace and words. In Arabic, we say, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, customarily, we say a few words just to get the energy right. So for those that are not new to this, don't get a little discomfort. Don't, don't grab, don't clench your, for the sisters here, please don't clench your purse. But we say something because this is the spirit of which we came here for, because this is the foundation of what our city needs. So as I say these three words, say it right after me. Hold the line! Hold the line! Hold the line! Hold the line! Oh man, the spirit is already moving. So we want to thank you all for coming out. I want to thank the mayor for allowing us to have this function to come together. This is the seventh annual men's breakfast meeting. Let's give that a round of applause. The seventh annual men's breakfast meeting. Now before we start, I would like to thank the councilmen for coming out. We want to thank our dignitaries for coming out. We want to thank our brothers from One Hood coming out. We want to thank the vendors for coming out. We want to thank all of you for coming out. We want to thank you for coming out. This is the men's meeting and it, we wouldn't have this if the community members didn't show up. You are so important in this city. So whether you feel like you aren't, we want you to know you are. We have this nice set up, you know, you can see the lights, got a little gold in it, a little light blue on the side. <laughs> we want you to feel special. We want you to feel special and you should feel special. So no matter what you go through, why not you? Why not you? So we want you to feel special to be able to have something to eat and mingle amongst each other. The mayor's going to give us some beautiful words. We have Charlemagne the God here. Give that a round of applause. Spoke to the brother. I thank the brother for coming out. He was more than eager to come out and bless us with a few words. So we're going to have a beautiful presentation with our brother as well. So we thank you for coming out. Hold the line! Hold the line! Oh, man, it still doesn't sound just quite right. So when the man gets up, we hope that the spirit gets more electri electrified. Um, so we have a few guest speakers that's going to open us up as well. Um, there's so much that comes with passing the baton. There comes so much when it comes to us in the city who lives here. And we have to think about the future. And the future is not 10 years from now. It's today. So we have a young brother, I don't, I'm going to allow him to introduce himself, a young brother who's been doing so much and he has a great idea and vision that he wants to see in the city of Newark. So with no more for myself, please help us to welcome our brother Drixen. Wow. Um, all right, how, uh, how do I sound? Is this okay? So, a little tall, a uh, little louder. So I had a speech prepared. We are going to forego the speech process and I'm just gonna have this handy dandy timer. All right, so today's a great day, obviously. This is our annual uh, breakfast meeting and uh, what I want to talk with you guys today is about communication. Because communication is the single most important aspect of running a community. Um, we cannot talk to each other, we cannot organize, we cannot build with each other if we can't communicate. And what I do, I'm an entrepreneur. So I build things, I build software, I build apps. When I was 17, I, uh, I taught myself how to code. Uh, I barely graduated because I would spend all of my time just, you know, instead of doing classwork, I'd just be trying to program, you know, trying to figure it out. Um, so I've been programming for a while, I've been building for a while, and uh, of all the things that I see uh, that our community wants, of all the things that I see the community needs, communication is at the very top. So what does that actually mean? It means that social media apps of today, they're making people anti-social, truly. When I use Instagram, when I use Facebook, and I log off for the day, typically I don't really feel like I'm in a better mood than when I got on. You know, it's a plethora of just controversial uh, content, you know, politics. Uh, you know, when good things happen, you know, when we celebrate something, typically you won't really see that in, uh, in your feed. Um, but 
if God forbid, you know, there's flooding or, you know, somebody gets evicted or somebody has, you know, a grief with the city, you'll see that. You know, controversy itself. So, in about two weeks, uh, I'll be launching uh, my very own social media app. Um, I've been building it for the past three years. And uh, it's crazy. It's so crazy. You know, we look at these social apps as like magic. You know, I was telling my mom the other day, um, you know, one feature we had to implement was, you know, when you're on Instagram and you're setting your username, if you're Roz Baraka, you want to be the only Roz Baraka, you know? So he sets it. And Instagram, they have to check through all the usernames, every single username on the app, and make sure that this one is available. In nanoseconds, millions upon millions, if not billions of searches. So having to implement that within my own app, it was, man, it sucks. But at the end of the day, ideas, you know, especially as a person who looks like me, who comes from a, a city like this, it has to be fully fleshed out. It has to be good. You have to be five times better. You have to work extra hard, extra hard to be able to compete. And as I say this, you know, it's, it's a lot of hard work. So in a few weeks, during North Tech Week, I'll be launching a social app. After this, after this wraps up, I'll be sticking around, um, you know, to showcase exactly what I have, if you're interested. You know, we have a lot of cool, uh, a lot of cool product screenshots. And you know, when I see today, you know, take this feeling, capture this feeling of joyousness, of love, of community, and I want to put it in a bottle and turn it into a social experience. That's honestly it. So without further ado, I would like to pass off the keys to Brother Abdul. Thank you, thank you all. Asadan wa alaikum. Where we about to eat at? For the last 10 years, we've been eating at 290 Orange Avenue in Irvington, New Jersey. Today, I'm proud to announce that with the help of Invest Nork, the support from the city of Nork, and a blessing from the Honorable Mayor Rajji Baraka, we will be eating at 263 Littleton Avenue in the Central Ward of North. Where I own the real estate. My name is Abdul Robeson. I'm the owner of the famous Abbeys. I was born and raised right here in North. Central Ward, Scudder Homes, specifically Howard Street Projects. And in those projects, I learned at a young age how to socialize, improvise, and prioritize the fundamentals to being a productive person in life. Back in 2019, I was invited to my first Norks men's meeting by my brother, Ra Rails. Most of y'all know him as Ra Ra. He's somewhere in here. Thanks for the invite, my brother. My life hasn't been the same since. The Norks Men's Meeting was created by the Iron Blue Mayor, Raj J. Baraka. The Nork Men's Meeting is the reason why my brother and I started a development company. And now on our first property in Nork, that will be finished on November the 1st, 2023. The Nork Men's Meeting is how I found out about Invest Nork, where I joined a streetwise MBA program, where I learned about financial literacy, acquiring loans, funding resources, and how to maintain a sustainable business. I've received multiple business certifications, such as an MBE, which is a Minority Business Enterprise Certification, a SBE, which is a small business enterprise certification, and the ABDCE, which is the New York and New Jersey Port Authority concessions certification, where we're allowed to work in anything that the Port Authority owns. Right. 
The North Men's Meeting is where I joined the Economic, Housing, and Development Committee, where I stand now as the acting president. That's right. In this committee, there's bankers, architects, developers, contractors, entrepreneurs, and just an unlimited amount of resourceful people. The Economic Housing Development Committee, in collaboration with Essex County Urban League of New Jersey, has brought for the first time ever in history the New Jersey Housing and Development Training Program to North New Jersey, where we are taught about credit, capacity, collateral, and the difference between market rent and subsidy as well as how to prepare performance, how to obtain local, state, and federal funding, with addition to community development. I'm one of the first and last people you see when you come to the North Men's Meeting. I socialize. I've made myself a resource for the North Men's Meeting, and I deliver without preparation. I improvise. I've missed one North Men's Meeting in the last three years. It's one of the most important things to me in my life. I prioritize. It's these three fundamentals I learned growing up in Howard Street Projects in the city of North that has me standing on this stage today. Socializing, improvising and prioritizing. I want to thank the Honorable Mayor Raj J. Baraka for creating the North Men's Meeting. Thank you, sir. And for creating unfathomable opportunities and for being the mayor of my time. As I conclude, I'm proud to say I'm from North, where legends, icons, and the greats are created. Hold the line. Thank y'all. Let's, let's give our brother a thunderous round of applause. Start hearing that other people are going through a lot of the same things 
that you're going through, you start to understand that you have a village. And you know there's scripture in that village. I mean, that's what happened with me. Like when I started talking about my issues with mental health, it wasn't because I was seeking any attention for it. It was almost like a cry for help. Like, you know, for me to get on the radio every day and have conversations about what other people might be doing in their lives, it would be disingenuous for me not to be talking about what's going on with me. So when I started talking about my issues with anxiety or about some depression and, you know, going to therapy, you know, once a week, people started coming to me having those same conversations, telling me that they deal with anxiety, that they deal with depression, that, you know, they, they go to therapy themselves, and then people started coming to me saying, man, because of you, my brother started going to therapy, or my uncle started going to therapy, or my husband started going to therapy. So that's when I realized that the only way to, you know, continue to eradicate the stigma around mental health is just for everybody to tell their story. Well, I think we're trying to go into the second question. What advice do you have for black men who may be struggling with similar issues but are afraid to see Man, <laughs> like I said, don't be afraid to tell your story because you know we don't we have this culture in our community of keeping secrets, yes, sir. and you know keeping those secrets doesn't benefit anybody. Like when I first started talking about my issues with mental health, man, it was Thanksgiving of 2018, and I was home in South Carolina, in Monk's Corner, South Carolina, and my dad, you know, he started telling me about how he was going to therapy two or three times a week, and he tried to commit suicide. You know, like 30 plus years ago, and he was on 10 to 12 different medications throughout his life and his mental health. And I remember going to my mom and saying, yo, you, you do pop some dealing with all of this? And she was like, I thought he was just playing crazy to get a check. Because, <laughs> because that's what eventually started happening in South Carolina. You know, you had a lot of people who were expressing their issues, and you know, the, the government of South Carolina didn't know what to do at the time. They were just giving people uh, a check every month, but that wasn't helping brothers to heal. That wasn't helping us you know, it was just throwing, you know, money at the problem, which is fine, but you still got to use that money and those resources to actually go out there and get help. So, you know, just in me telling my story, it opened up my, my father to tell his story to me. And I, I think it just goes back to that. Like, we all constantly got to tell our stories because when we tell our stories, that's how you start sharing resources. That's how you start telling brothers about therapy. That's how you start telling brothers about, you know, meditation. That's when you know, uh, lo local government start opening up resources for people to go out there and do, uh, to, 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 to give people resources to go out there and, you know, do, do that work. So, I just so, think we all got to talk. So, you know, what about, like, you know how, you know, our, in our culture and how we think about each other and it's all, I want to open up, man, that's that weak stuff. Like, what, what do you deal with, what do you deal with those of us that have that mentality where it's, you know, it's all, like, I want to talk about my feelings. Like, Yes, sir. I mean, you talking about your feelings to yourself. Like you're at home staring in that mirror, probably crying, dealing with depression, you're trying to numb the pain with drugs, you're trying to numb the pain with alcohol. You know, I don't think there's anything soft about going out there to, you know, do the work on yourself. You know, I think it's I think it's worse, I think it's weaker to not go do the work. You know what I mean? I think it's weaker to know you're not okay and allow yourself to stay not okay. You know, I think we all got to look in the mirror and tell ourselves it's okay to not be okay. And I guarantee you, you can have a conversation with, you know, somebody in this room and in some way, shape, or form, they went out there and they've done some type of work, whether it's therapy, you know, whether it's counseling. Like, somebody has dealt with the same issues that you've dealt with. But there's, there's nothing weak about going out there to, uh, you know, get help and become a better version of yourself. Thank you. Um, I wanted to move to the next question. Now, I also want to shout out, we have the Office of Violence Prevention. Uh, what, the mayor did, what the mayor did was pull 5% of public safety budget in founding the Office of Violence Prevention. So we have people that go out into the community to help us on one-on-one -on -one conversations, conflict resolution, and a special shout out to the One Hood, you know, brothers that live in the streets and now are pushing a new direction, a new way of life. And it's important we talk about mental health. So now I want to ask a question. What do you think of the state of black men in America and how can they cope with these stresses while also taking care of their mental well-being? That's a broad question. <laughs> um, I mean, the state of black men in America is black men are doing what we've always done, which is, which is try to survive, you know? But I think that uh, we got to remember as black men that we might be the first generation of, of black people in here, period, who got the luxury of healing. You know, I think the generation prior to us they were really just trying to survive. You know, what they say on good time, they were just scratching and surviving, you know what I mean? But we got the opportunity to not just 
survive, we got the opportunity to go out there, you know, do the work, seek the proper healing so we can we can thrive, you know, and I think that we just like I keep saying, we just gotta keep having conversations with each other. Like we're not doing anything, we're not doing ourselves no favor by having this culture of secrecy that we have in our community. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> I'm dealing with something, but I don't want to tell the next person because I'm afraid of judgment, you know. Uh, this person is dealing with something, but he don't want to tell the next person because he's afraid of judgment. How can we help ourselves if we're not being honest with ourselves? You know, and I think right now, I've seen black people, black men, black women, we, we're being more honest, you know, with each other than I think ever. You know, I just want us to continue to have those conversations like this in person and not on social media, you know, because I think on social media, you know, we leave too much room for like that cyber coin tell pro to get involved and be throwing things out there to constantly keep us at odds with each other instead of actually having real communication with each other that can be beneficial to our community. Now, you talk about therapy and you talk about therapists. I wanted to move and say that you've been an advocate of destigmatizing therapy. Could you share your thoughts on how black men can find culturally competent therapists who understand their unique experiences? That's a great question, and that's very important because when I first started, you know, going to therapy, you know, I still had, uh, I still had those, those notions of not wanting to be judged. So I was actually looking for somebody who was like the exact opposite of me. Like I didn't want to go talk to a, a, a black therapist at the time. I have a black therapist now, but I didn't want to talk to a black therapist at the time because I didn't want to sit down with somebody who might have the same biases that I have, who might have the same preconceived notions about the world that I have. And man, if you think that it's, you know, hard to find a, a, a black therapist, go try to find like a, a, a Asian therapist or something like that. Because that's what I was looking for. I was looking for somebody who I felt like was just going to be completely neutral about anything that I was, I was going through. But I'm glad I have a, a black therapist now. I actually have a black man. And I'm glad because he is culturally competent. Because there are things that we all deal with collectively as black men that only we understand. So when you're sitting down with another brother, you don't have to explain it. You can just say what it is. And that he, he'll know exactly what you're feeling. He'll know exactly what you're going through. Because nine times out of 10, he's experienced it. Or he's going through it too. Your, your waste. You'll waste 40 minutes in a therapy session sitting down with somebody who's not culturally competent because you gotta explain what it is you're even dealing with to begin with. And I remember one time man, I was in, when I was with one of my first therapists and she was really good, but she was a, she was a white woman. And I remember you know, breaking down something to her just about like 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 social media and the internet. And she looked at me and she told me, "Why don't you just turn off your phone? Good advice, but I'm not paying hundred dollars an hour for that." You know? So that's why I think, you know, culturally competent therapists are good because you they, they understand you know, culture. So uh, in the context of mental health, what advice would you give to parents and mentors on supporting young black men in fostering their emotional well-being? You know, we see the criteria and the condition of like our young people and a lot of them are acting up and I don't know if you're familiar with like uh, the Kia challenge. Um, pretty much what is gonna happen with AutoFed is that because of a TikTok trend of how you can pretty much steal a Kia or a Honda with an iPhone charger, we've seen a lot of our young people uh, skyrocket into that uh, AutoFed. So now we know our young people are going through stuff and how can we help them and be able to counsel them as they go through their affairs because we see a lot of drug activities and our young people smoking, popping pills, um, and you know. Yeah, get to the root of it. That's why I keep saying, you know, having the conversation, telling our story, because you know, back in the day, people would, you know, commit those kind of acts and we would just talk it up to, oh, they need to be disciplined. But you know, people are dealing with all types of traumas, right? People are dealing with all types of pain and all types of hurt that they haven't gotten any help for. And what usually happens in those situations, we end up projecting that pain and that hurt onto other people, you know, onto, the, onto our own communities. And it's usually people that look like us. So that's why I think, you know, we have to implement, you know, social and emotional learning in schools. That's why I think this conversation about mental health is so important. Because man, nine times out of 10, that brother or that sister, they just need a hug, right? They just need, Sit, they just need to sit down with somebody and, you know, unpack that, that trauma that so much of us experience young. Like, you know, we're just so quick 
to discipline people. You know, we're so quick to just, you know, take a person, oh, you know, sit them in jail. You know, what is that what is that gonna do for them ultimately though? Know, they end up going to a place where whatever they were dealing with on the outside, when they go on the inside, they probably become more of a savage just just to survive. You know, but a lot of times, man, you just gotta sit these sit these kids down and like get them some help early. Like I was I was talking to you know a therapist or a counselor when I was in second, third, fourth grade. You know, that would have kept me from getting into a lot of the situations that I got into. A lot of times, man, when you see brothers joining gangs or you know, linking up with different crews to get involved in whatever activities they're getting in, man, they really doing that because all of us deep down inside, we want a community, you know, we want somebody that we can look to and say, oh, that's my, it doesn't matter what me and that brother are doing, you know, so if you can get them early and you can get them involved in the more positive things, and you can get them involved in the nation, that unity and that group operation they're looking for, it will still happen, you know, so I just think you gotta just get, get, the, get the people, get the people early and help them run back their traumas and then they don't end up just projecting that trauma on everybody else. And then we're going to open it up. Uh, a few of us are going to take on a few questions. Um, so have the question in mind. Don't make up one, just add one. <laughs> um, my last question is, can we be successful in business without addressing our mental health? Or is there a connection between mental health and business? Can you be successful in business? Um, yeah, you can be successful in business, but I don't know if it's going to be sustainable. You know, because, you know, at the end of the day, you can't run from yourself. You know, I don't feel like you can be sustainable or have any long-term success, period, if you don't do the work on yourself in some way, shape, or form. Like, you know, I feel like your know, brothers have to go out there and, you know, get a therapist. Brothers have to have a counselor. You have to unpack that trauma that's in you, because if you don't deal with your trauma, your trauma eventually is going to deal with you. And that trauma is going to show up in every aspect of your life. I don't care if it's... You know, in your personal relationship, you know, in, in, in with your woman, or in your personal relationship with your friend, or in your relationship with business, eventually that trauma is going to show up and cause you to self-destruct in some way, shape, or form. You know, like I was always taught that, you know, your, uh, your talent will take you where your, where, your, where your character can't sustain you. So when you ask me, can you be successful? Yeah, but for, for how long? Will you be successful? You like, eventually, whatever you've been sweeping up under the rug, you are gonna trip and stumble and fall over that same rug. And then when you look up under that rug, it's all your stuff. But you're the one who swept it under the rug instead of like actually cleaning it up, putting it where it needs to be in the trash, and throwing it out. So now nah, we all gotta go do that uh, internal work if we wanna have long-term success in anything. Thank you very much. How important for the younger generation is it not just to talk about therapy, but exposure to other things other than what they might see in your, right? Like getting out into nature, getting out into like hiking, exposure to other cultures, you kind of mentioned that. How important do you think that is for them just to see how big the world really is and expand their mind? Oh, it's very important, but you know, um, I, I don't put that on the younger generation. I put that on us to expose it to the younger generation. Because, you know, everything that I've unlearned <laughs> over the past, you know, 10 or 15 years, it was an OG that taught me. You know, uh, one of the greatest, you know, joys in my life now is when I have, like I said, my father or my uncle tell me that they're learning so much from things that I'm, I'm, I'm saying, the things that I'm doing now. And, you know, one thing that we we never got, at least I never got when I was young, I'm getting now, you never got, like, apologies from adults, right? So when you have adults now that apologize to you for how they steered you wrong, because now they know better, so they're doing better. You know, to me, that's all part of, like, breaking those cycles of generational trauma. So it's, just, it's up to us to instill that in the younger people, to let them know, oh, there is a a world outside of Newark, or there is a world outside of South Carolina, even though where we're from is, is beautiful, but I want you to go see other things so you can go see those other things and bring them back, you know, to your community. So I think that's, that's, that's extremely important. I was just sitting here thinking about 
since you really set the stigma about treating mental health issues in our community as a uh, black man especially. What do you think a major obstacle is now when there's so many more resources, resources available? For example, I'm sure about 99.9% of people has a cell phone within arm's reach. So that being said that even uh, Medicaid, Medicare, these uh, public health uh, insurance on the uh, marketplace, they, since COVID, they're all paying for virtual medicine. So if it's a privacy issue, I don't want to see the uh, therapist's office is down. I don't want uh, my boy to see me walk into the that building because that's so crazy. They got a phone, Medicaid, Medicare, public health insurance will pay for it. Do you think they don't know about it? Because I, I can pick up the phone and get an appointment within four days, so I don't know. I no, I, 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 no, I understand totally what you're saying. That's why I keep telling all of us, man, we should not be afraid to tell our story because we've been telling that story. We'll start talking about, you know, resources. You're absolutely right. Most of the time, people don't even know where to go to get started on their healing journey. You know, I'm shameless plug right now. I do, a, I do an event called the Mental Wealth Expo every year. You know, this will be my third annual one. We do it in honor of World Mental Health Day. The next one we have is um, next Saturday, October 7th, at the Marriott Marquis Times Square in Manhattan. And it's a free event from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. And I bring together a bunch of psychiatrists, a bunch of therapists, mental health experts, mental health advocates, and we just have a day of panels. And it's literally from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. And it's a free event. And I do that because I want people to come and get the answers to the questions that you know, you're know you delivering to me now. Like, you'll know where to go to get that free telehealth. Telehealth is big, you know. Um, a lot of people, especially during COVID, you know, they started going therapy and talking to psychiatrists, you know, via Zoom and via these, you know, telemethods. And to your point about you know, people being afraid to be seen walking into a psychiatrist's office or a therapist's office, it will always be strange to me that, you know, we have no problem letting people see us do BS. But when it comes to actually doing something positive, that can benefit us and make us better people, we're ashamed of it. Nah, you should be ashamed to be out there selling dope. Like, you should be ashamed to be out there, you know, popping pills. Like, you should be ashamed to let people see you do that, as opposed to, you know, letting you see, see you do something positive. How you doing? What's up, brother? What do you think the role of masculinity is in today's society? Especially now that there's a, a war going on between masculinity and femininity. That's a great question. I mean, I, I've always felt like our, our, our job as men is to protect and provide, but I think we got to learn how to be men first. And I don't even know if you know what we were taught growing up is necessarily you know like manhood. You know, growing up, you know, they taught us that we got to be hard. You know, we got to be gangsters, we got to be thugged out, like, you know, we got to walk around with our chest out. Like, there was literally a genre called being hardcore. And I think that, you know, until we find that proper balance between the sacred masculine and the divine feminine within all of us, I don't think we can show up, you know, as the best versions of ourselves as men, you know? So, you know, when people have that, they have that conversation, they're like, yo, yo, what is, what is manhood? I'm like, I really don't know, because I know it wasn't what, what I was taught, you know, growing up. But I do know that as a man, my job is to protect and provide. But I think, you know, that protection and provision starts with me first. So that's why I keep stressing us to go out there and do the work on ourselves. And if we do the work on ourselves, we can show up as the best version of men for our women, for our children, for our communities. Good morning. Um, my name is Hector Perez. Um, Good morning, brother. Um, one of the ACs House in Kelly, and I also run a fatherhood program here in Essex County. Um, the thing I'm going to talk about is the stigma of deadbeat dads in the Hispanic and Black community. Yeah. I have my daughter with me, she's with me all the time, and I know in today's day and age there's a lot of fathers that are doing more with their kids, but it's still that stigma. What are some resources? that you think we can provide for us that try to help other men to show that 
there are less deadbeat dads, and maybe there aren't any more deadbeat dads if the moms allow us to be more in our kids' lives. I think when it comes to that, man, we just gotta continue to show and prove what actions and deeds, not words and lip service. You know, like I got four daughters. I'm, 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 I got four daughters and I'm married to the, the, the mother of my children. You know, me, me and my wife been together for 25 years. So whenever people talk about the stigma of, you know, deadbeat fathers, every brother I know is, is, a, is a father to that child, you know? And, and the ones that aren't, to your point, you know, they're not being allowed to because the issue is with the mother of their child. I think that goes back to something that, you know, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan always talks about, and that's the science of breeding, you know? But what the minister say? He says, you know, sometimes we treat breeding like we rolling dice in the back of a moving pickup truck, you know? So I just think that we all gotta be very, you know, conscious of, you know, who, who we choose to partner with, men and women, you know? Because a lot of times we start screaming, deadbeat father, or, you know, the mother is no good, I don't think they just got that way. I think that you just might have had your eyes closed and wasn't paying attention. You might have been thinking what you, you know, instead of your brain. That's the whole. So I just think that you know, we just gotta continue to show and prove through, through actions and deeds in regards to like, you know, dispelling that, that myth of the, of the deadbeat, the deadbeat black and brown father. Because all, all the brothers I know, they, they in their child's lives are actively fighting to be in their child's lives. Uh, peace, how you doing? I'm um, Carlos Javier, I'm a husband, father, and director for the All-Star Project. As a father, what techniques can we do with our children to create the opportunity for communication? What techniques do you recommend for us to do that work that you're saying about Ooh, man. I mean, I got a 15-year-old daughter, an 8-year-old daughter, a 5-year-old daughter, and a 2-year-old daughter. So. That's a constant learning process. Like there is no manual that you can give somebody and say, hey, this is how it should be done. It's just, it's just impossible, you know, because I don't always get it right. When I go back to, you know, when I go back to the conversation I was having about apologizing to your kid, man, sometimes you're not having the best day, you know, and sometimes you might snap, you know, or you might raise your voice. Like I'm not the disciplinarian like that my parents was. I'm not telling nobody to go pick no switch. I'm not, I don't beat my kids. You know? that's, just, that's just not how I get down. But, you know, sometimes you might raise your voice and you, you still feel bad about that. And talking about communication, I'll go to my children and apologize to them for that. You know what I'm saying? I'm sorry that I got, I, I raised my voice at you. Or I'm sorry I snapped at you like that. And I'll explain to them what it is I'm going through, I'm not having the best day, you know, I took it out on you, apologies. I think that goes a long way in regards to communication, because like I said, I never got that from my, my father growing up. So, you know, me and him, I, I had issues, the first time I ever had a breakthrough in therapy was realizing, man, you know, my issues with my father stem from me being upset that he would discipline me for things that he never taught me. But my father was also disciplining me out of fear and not love because he didn't want me to make the same mistakes that he made. So when he saw me making those same mistakes, he would, he would bug out. So it's like, you know, for me, just having that communication with my daughters and letting them know when I'm wrong, not being afraid to apologize, I think that opens things up for them to share those feelings in that same way. I remember during COVID, my, my oldest daughter came to me and my wife and she was in tears and she just was like, I'm overwhelmed. That was her, that was the language she used. She said, I'm overwhelmed. And that was a simple, yo, come here, baby, give her a hug, give her a kiss and let her know, like, we not tripping if your grades slip during this time. Like, this is an unprecedented time. None of us have ever dealt with this, you know, pandemic called COVID. So you don't have to worry about us being upset with you because, you know, your, your grades are slipping. And I can totally understand why you're overwhelmed at a time like this. Because I couldn't imagine being in middle school, having to wake up every day and, do lessons on Zoom. I remember her doing like a pottery project on the kitchen floor. And I'm like, I couldn't even imagine what that what that what that felt like. So I just think to keep the lines of communication open, man, we just have to be honest about our feelings, what we're going through, and I really think the kids will pick up on that and they'll they'll reciprocate the same energy to us.
It don't sound like a question. I did 25 years in prison, and, and when I came out, I went straight into third because I needed it. You know, and I think it's a stigma when us men for us, you know, going into third. You know, I got out, I got out of prison in, in 2000, 2010. I went to the VA and registered, and I've been in therapy for the last 13 years. And, you know, it has been good for men, you know, because in prison, we deal with trauma. And you know, in Vietnam, I dealt with trauma. And when I came out here, you know, getting united with the family after 25 years and losing so many people over the 25 years, you know, it's trauma. So, you know, I encourage the brother, you know, don't be afraid. If you have a problem, go see how that help. You know, it's been good for me. You know, I'm 74 years old. I feel like a young man. I'm around a lot of young people. <laughs> Don't be afraid. You know, it's no stigma to need help. You know, I can't be brothers without You know, they give me courage, you know, to keep me going. So, you know, my thing is just pick up if you need help because don't wait until it's too late. Thank you. You know, don't wait until it's too late. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You want to take on the question? Brother Ray, you got a question or a comment? It's a, it's a question? Okay. I would like to know what relation you see between mental health and substance abuse, especially with uh, illegal substance abuse, especially with all the overdoses that are happening in New Jersey. Oh yeah, I think they go hand in hand. I think they go hand in hand because you know, uh, brothers and sisters are looking for some sort of healing. Brothers and sisters are looking for some sort of escape, and you know, they're they're, they're doing it through. Drug and alcohol, like it's, it's really just that simple. You know, a lot of times people don't even really understand the issues that they're going through because, like I said, we're not having enough conversations, we're not telling our stories. If my father would have told me that he was dealing with anxiety and depression when he was younger, when I started in those same two, all the way back in elementary school, then I would have known what it is that I was going through. So a lot of people know what you're going through, you're just trying to find an escape. And if you try that substance, you know, that drug, whatever it is, even for that brief moment, it makes you, you know, forget the pain that you're dealing with or remember the pain that you're dealing with. You're going to keep doing it, and that's how addiction, you know, comes into play. So that's why all of this stuff that we're talking about today is so important. So we need people to actually go get real hit. It's not that artificial, you know, uh, numbing of the pain that the, that the drug and alcohol causing. My question, um, basically, um, is pertaining to mental health. And um, I know a brother spoke about mental health for like a lot of the brothers, you know what I mean, sisters who go to the army and experience a lot of you know, violence over there. But um, we working on a documentary right now, and I ain't trying to be plug nothing, but it's ain't plug like this. But we're working on the documentary now with a lot of my homies. I come from the gang culture, and I believe a lot of my homies suffer from PTSD from a lot of the stuff they've seen in the field and stuff that they've been involved in. And um, how can we? try to help the homies get their minds right for coming home from prison. Nobody really focused on that. But they've been in wars and stuff in their communities and stuff that they've been doing too to help get them better, to have them moving better, being productive members of their community. I think we even tap into the mental health of a lot of our brothers too. Absolutely. I mean, there's, there's no one answer to that question. But you know, when you say coming home from prison, I think a lot of times, man, they have to start in prison. I think, you know, they call these places correctional facilities, but there's no really, there's no real you know, like I said earlier, you take these brothers who was already at war in the street and you put them in a prison where they gotta, you know, double down on the savagery just to survive, they gonna come home even worse. So, you know, luckily, sometimes there's people in prison who might get involved with the nation or other things and they find some type of spirituality so they start doing the work on themselves in prison. But I think that if you're gonna send people to this facility, you know, why wouldn't you take the time to actually make them you know, productive citizens. Let them go in there and actually get, you know, learn some type of trade that they can use when they come home, you know. Um, give them access.
access to actual mental health counseling and therapy so they can deal with some of that trauma that they experienced in the street. Like, none of this stuff is normal. Like, yo, it's not normal to watch somebody get their brains blown out every single day. It's not normal for us to be picking up our phone and seeing acts of violence happen throughout our communities. Like, it's, it's, it's become the norm, but none of it, none of it is normal. So it's, it's, a, it's a layered, it's a layered answer, man. Like, there's no, there's no one answer to that question, but I think it really just starts with all of us who know better, doing better, and, and, and teaching people and showing people where they can get the accesses and the resources. But I really think inside those prison walls, man, we have to start providing real access and the real resources so we can, you know, help these brothers become productive citizens when they when they hit the street. No, man, I just think this is such a beautiful event, man. I mean, these are the type of things that we need to be doing. We always talk about, you know, having these, like, these, these conversations amongst each other. But like I said, I feel like so much of this stuff happens digitally nowadays. But to be able to sit down, eat a meal, look each other in the eyes, network, share talk about things that we're dealing with. I think this is, man, this is so important. Like, you're the type of thing that didn't exist when I was, when I was about to come up. So, man, you got to really give me man a round of applause for putting something like this together. And, 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 and also, I just want to end by saying, hold the line, Lord. Give my brother a round of applause. Oh man. Let's give our brother a thunderous round of applause again. Oh man, thank you, thank you, thank you. We want to thank you all for coming out again. We want to just do a special shout out. I want to thank our brother. I don't know where you at, brother Anque. Where you at, brother Anque? Oh, brother. Can you just stand up real quick? Come on. We got to give this brother. Hold the line. Hold the line. Brother. Brother, I, I would be remiss if I didn't thank our brother who held the line and who kind of just passed the baton. And he's been in my life just always giving the kind word. Sometimes we always ask ourselves, what can we say to a person? Man, just leave with a kind word. We, we're already watching you. We're already observing you. So this brother has been holding the line down and it's just been such an inspiration, man. We appreciate you. We love you, brother. And thank you once again, man. Thank you. Thank you. Before our mayor comes up, we want to just give a few uh, shout outs to some of the organizations. We want to shout out North Street Academy. We want to shout out North Anti-Violence Coalition. We want to shout out North Public Safety Collaborative, Unity Community Corporation, The Hub, No Days Off, One Hood, New Direction, Office of Violence Prevention, Brick City Peace Collective, New Next Generation, Off Opportunity Youth Network, My Brother's Keeper, Leaders for Life, All Stars Project, Returning Citizens, Complex Vision, Hope, Love, and Kindness. And we want to shout out the students from St. Elizabeth University. These students from St. Elizabeth University was funded by a program from Brick City Peace Collective where they'll be giving a full ride to college. Shout these young brothers out. All praise is due to Allah. All praise is due to Allah. As our mayor comes up in a few moments. Sorry, let me get this tab right. I want to thank the mayor again for having the opportunity to be here up front because this is so important. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank everybody for coming out. Hold the line. Hold the line. Hold the line. Hold the line.
You know, it's so important for us, and as we understand why we have this, it's important for us to have a foundation in the community, to have something for the men to come together. We represent the backbone in society. Yes, sir. You represent the backbone in society. Yes, sir. So for the men to come together, men sharpen men like steel sharpen steel. Men sharpen men like steel sharpen steel. Yes, so the coming to a foundation in a community where we can learn from amongst each other. It is so important to have the knowledge, to have the wisdom, the purpose of knowledge. And as you can see, one of the things that separates man from beast is knowledge. Knowledge feeds the development of the human being so that the person can grow and evolve into the divine and become one with his creator. Man's objective, man's objective is to become one with God. So we have to come into the knowledge and wisdom of understanding. We have to grow. We have not been learning so well because of the systems that have often disenfranchised us. We have not been learning so well because we have been learning in a poor educational system. So it's important for us to have something of our own to build and come into the knowledge of self. Knowledge satisfies our natural thirst for gaining that which will make us one with our maker. So true education cultivates the person's mind, body, and spirit by bringing us closer to fulfilling the purpose of being. What is man's purpose? What is your purpose in life? Your purpose is not something easily found. So you have to go through something. You have to go through something to find yourself. And that is not easily said. You have to go through adversity. We have to go through something. So this is why in the Quran it says man was meant to face difficulty. Struggle means that there is something that you must move against that is the natural impediment to prove yourself. You have to break through the impediment the blemish of your own self. There's entirely too much distrust amongst each other. There's entirely too much distrust amongst each other. On the matters of business, I understand you want to do business with your brother, but you got the mindset your brother's going to backdoor you. We have to get that out of our heads. We have to trust in ourselves, and we have to put trust in our community. We therefore had to build or produce trust in ourselves in order to do something for self and kind. We cannot depend on anyone to continue to care for us and build a future of us and give our young people an opportunity. The distrust in us is destroying our community. I understand you've gone through something with your brother. You've been hurt. You've been backdoored. But we cannot allow that to pass on to the generation that's coming up. We cannot allow something like that to happen. So I love our brother Abdul, who has the Economic Housing Committee, because we have to go through something, because when it comes to business, you think you're going to get backdoored. You think someone is going to snake you. But you have to learn the intricates of business so that when you come into a proper understanding, you don't know. It's not instant gratification. It takes time. It takes time to reap some of the harvests that we see that is happening in our city. No man plants a seed today and expects it to be the fruit tomorrow. It takes time for the soil to marinate with the seed and the seed to breathe forth a small life germ of a plant and to manifest into the, to the beautiful vegetables and fruits that we see. It takes time and we have to give each other patience. We have to give each other that level of grace. We deserve it. Why not? Right. Okay, fine. So what? Your brother has a blemish. So what? Your brother is faulty. In Matthew 7, verse 3, it says, Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but not consider the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your own eye and look at a plank in your own eye? So this is why it says in 1 John 4 verse 20, if someone says I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God? You see your brother every day. You're with your brother every day. So there's something we can go through and, and make sure that our community, the city of Newark, is a better city. And all praise is due to Allah. All praise is due to Allah. You can change your life in the twinkling of an eye if you change your perspective of what is valuable. 
You can build a greater economy foundation for the whole when the ego is not in the way. We have to take on the mind of a student when one thinks who knows, one develops arrogance. Once we become arrogant in what we think and what we know, we come out of the state of being a student. One of the characteristics of being a student is humility. We have to get the ego aside. You don't know everything. Sorry. God didn't come in person of you to know every degree of wisdom and knowledge of understanding. But through your brother, if you can see the gifts and attributes within your brother, he has something that is great about him. And if you can look deeply within him, you can help and it can nurture within yourself. Yes, I don't know everything, but I know you. And because you know something, I can pull some of that attribute and it can help make me a better man. We need better communities and better marriages in our community. And all praises is due to Allah. Yes, in the scriptures it says, train up a child in a way that he should go, and when told, he will not depart from it. Brother Charlemagne says something so important, I just want to close on this. He said, now that I'm growing up, I make sure that I apologize to my children. We have to think about family from the perspective of children in the communication aspect of how we communicate to our young. You don't think it has heart in the heart when we don't apologize to the child, when we can't even see our own wrong? We have to grow and improve in the love in our community. I understand you came in, you got a networking idea in the business and you want to talk to the mayor. Cool, talk to him, but at the same time, talk to your brother because surely you don't know what he can bring. So with no more for myself, please help us to receive our mayor, Ra Raz J. Baraka. Hold the line! Hold the line! Hold the line! We done, some of us gotta find out what hold the line mean. But I appreciate y'all being here today. I wanna say um, there are three entities that are here today that I want you guys to mingle and mix with. And uh, you know, I told, uh, I was having a meeting with my directors and I told them when we have the retreat, the retreat is really, the, the most important part of the retreat is not me giving the speech or the content, is you communicating with one another. Your ability to work with each other is what makes this retreat whole. So your ability to talk to each other when this is done is what makes this even better, right? Because some people don't know folks in here. You need to get, as, get to know as many people as you can. We have uh, Invest Newark that, uh, that Abdul talked about. Brother Marcus is here from Invest Newark. He's right here. We have uh, the Housing Authority is here as well. Uh, raise your hand, Norma. Norma from the Housing Authority. I think they have a table outside as well. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about the housing authority, not just talking about housing today. We also had Newark Public Schools. They should be out there as well uh, with their uh, procurement office and I think somebody from the human resources office as well. And I'm saying that, and, and our city folks are here too, because between those three, you're talking about hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. So that's, that's, that. we're not trying to applause for that. We want you to stop and think. Because I'm, I'm not up here for, to put on a show. You know, people come here, you can tell people who want to be entertainers, they come with their cameras. They come to entertain. That's what, I'm not here for a show. At the end of the day, there's hundreds of millions of dollars. And when these people give out a contract, if they have a $27 million contract and we don't give you a piece of that contract, then we're not doing what we're supposed to do. Now I want you to be clear on that. So if I have a $27 million contract to put up cameras, then damn it, some of that $27 million should go to some of the brothers in here who can put up some cameras. Because I know we know how to put up cameras. If we, if, if we have a sanitation contract to, to, to move debris, and we put out a five to $10 million sanitation contract to move debris, and we just finding people outside of the city, then we're not doing our job. If we have a contract here, right, any kind of contract in this city, 
that we've been talking about in the men's meeting month after month after month after month after month. And the people in this room, if you don't hold them accountable for making sure that your family can eat, then you are not the provider that you say you are. You are not the protector that you say you are. You can't allow people to walk around with millions of dollars and your grandmother can't even go to the corner store and feel safe with her pocketbook with $25 worth of food stamps. We got to make sure that people who come in our community with money understand that they can't leave our community with that money unless we get a part of that. And that means, and I'm not, and, I'm, and listen, I'm not telling you to do nothing that you shouldn't do. What I'm telling you is get yourself together. Get your business and your paperwork right so when you visit these people that they're able to give you the things that they know they should give you in the first place. And they make it easier for you to get access to these things. That's why we have these meetings. That's what this is about. So it's not really a joke. I'm glad they shouted out my brother, Al Tariq Ankwe, because listen, this don't happen if he didn't start it. I just want to make that clear. There's a lot of, and I asked, I called brother, asked him to come here today because I've been getting too much back and forth about me and Al Tariq Ankwe. That is my brother. I just want to make it clear. And we started this. He did the work to make this happen. We, we passed it off to the younger brother to, to, to finish the work that we supposed to do, but we together. And I, I want everybody to know that even when we don't think the same sometimes and we have disagreements, we always got to be brothers. We love each other. We love each other. Listen, the brother said something about deadbeat dads. I'm going to tell you that that's not true. I, I left a message in the men's meeting the day I couldn't be there. I, I, I looked at some research that the Centers for Disease Control did. The Centers for Disease Control, national organization, surveyed and did a study on black men, just period. They just did a study. And, and the study said that even though we're not married at the same rates as other communities are, that we actually are in our children's lives at higher rates than people who are, that are married to their own, to their wives. That's, that's the center of disease control. Now listen, listen. That's, that's another conversation about marriage but, uh, that we should have, but at the end of the day, we are taking care of our children, even, even in the most difficult times, even in the most trying times. We take care of our children because we see our face in their face. We want them to have better than we had. We are taking care of them. They proved that to us. They put a study out that said that, that we, we, we doing our baby's hair. We're showing up to school. We're changing their clothes. We're teaching them how to ride a bike. We're taking them to the amusement park. We're showing up on mama's porch, even though we got beef with mom, we're showing up on the porch anyway. We there through hook or crook, just like we here. We here today, despite where we came from and what we dealt with last night, we made it here this morning. Despite the, 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 the difficulties we deal with for, for weeks and months, we still made it here today. All of the stuff that we went through individually and collectively, we look good in this room. Y'all look beautiful in this room. You look strong in this room. You look powerful in this room. I don't care how many times you've been to jail, you look good today. I don't care how many beefs you have with old boy, you look good today. When we come in the room together, this is power, how powerful this room is because we decided today that we're gonna be together. One hood is powerful. It's, po it's powerful because we made a decision to be together. We made a decision to be together. I just want to talk briefly about our enemies, then I'm going to go back into business. I got to talk about our enemies. Because there's enemies of, of this right here. That's what they mad at, this. You thought they was mad at me. The only reason they mad at me is because I have influence. And because you came here, and if they had something, they wouldn't go there. Yeah. 
I'm going to talk about our enemies just for a second. I'm going to tell you something. The devil can't kill you. Listen, your enemies know they can't destroy you. So their objective is not to destroy you because they already know they can't. They can't kill you. They know this already. So their objective really is to weaken you, weaken you enough so you kill yourself. The devil can't destroy you. So his objective is to make you succumb, get so low that you wind up dying anyway. You drink yourself to death. You, you, you overdose. You die on the street somewhere. Your business falls apart. You lose your family. You've been fighting to stay out of jail. Now you're going back. The devil's job is to weaken your mind and your spirit. They get in your face and provoke you because you know they know who you are. They know your character. They know what's inside you, the fire in your belly. And if they talk too loud and get too close, that you might do something to one of them. So their job is to provoke you as much as they possibly can so they can do that, then videotape you doing it. And, and, and when you do that, they break you, right? They actually, you break yourself. And then they sit back and watch that happen. Now apply that to all of the stuff that you've been doing in your community, in your family, in your neighborhood. Never mind that you made a mistake, you're trying to get right. You're trying to build something now. So there's people around you who are trying to prevent you from building it. Who want to tell you that it's not going to work, that it's weak, that it's not going to happen that you can't do this, that you can't do that, that voice in your head, and they bring people around you whose job it is to break up everything that you've built, to whisper in people's ears that are next to you, that are cause dissension between the ranks in your ranks. That's what we say hold the line for, because the, the enemy's job is to cause dissension in your ranks, to break your ranks down to make your brother look sideways at you. That's what the enemy's goal is, to disrupt unity. Now, who the hell would be against a men's meeting? Who, who would be opposed to that? We, are, we here on September the, uh, 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 we here, excuse me, excuse me, the 30th, the 30th. Uh, there's a, there's a, uh, uh, number 30 in one of the lessons, and number 30 says the traitor disappeared and there was no one left to speak their own language. I learned that when I was 15, that a traitor disappeared and there was no one left to speak their own language. That's, that's 30. No one, and, 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 and if people can't speak your language, then you can't communicate with them. And if you can't communicate with them, it's difficult to create you, the unity that you need or bring folks together. So they're trying to force us, trying to force us to not be able to communicate with one another. You know, in the, in the Islamic religion here, in, 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 when we convert in America, they change your name. You change your name, you, you get a new name. You get, a, you get a new name because you want a name that is recognizable to God. You want a name that's recognizable that when he calls you, you turn around. You want, you want to, like when you go home and you call your son's name, you want him to say, yes, daddy. You want to be able to communicate so they turn around, they change names. In, in, in the Bible, there's a story of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego who got their names changed that the king changed their names on purpose because prior to that, they had names of God, so he didn't want them to have names of God. He changed their names to regular names. He changed their names to regular names because he did not want them to recognize who they were connected to and want them to be connected to him. And the problem is that when you call somebody out of their name, 
They won't respond. They don't understand because they don't know who you talking to. My son's name is Jew. It means fierce light. It means light, like light of the world, like knowledge. If I go home and call him something else, he'll say, that's not my name. My name is Jew. Yeah. And if I called him something else, he's not going to respond to me because that's not his name. We have been responding to names that other people have been calling us for years and not responding to our own names because we don't know what the hell our own names are. And we find out who we are, we find out who we are, we get this certain level of power and we walk around and you can see the power. People can see when you change. And, and really what's attracting people to you is the magnetism of the truth you speak, not you. You think it's your clothes and your shoes and your hat. You thought it was you and the way you walk, but it's really the truth that's bringing people towards you. They see that change in you, that power in you, that God in you, that you recognize your own name, and they trying to figure out how did he get that name? I want to be just like that. I want that name too. So when brother come home and start new direction, people looking at him sideways, but there's some people that see God in the work. They see it in the mist. And so they recognize that and they have a magnetic attraction, a natural magnetic attraction to the truth. So they stand up on the truth. To truth in a square. They stand up on the truth because they know the truth will set them free. They unite with the truth. And people get jealous of that. They get envious of that. And they become ugly around that. And they make it their job every day that they wake up to destroy that. Those people are our enemies. Yes, sir. Anybody that wants to prevent us from being together is an enemy of us. Anybody that wants to prevent us from loving each other is our enemy. Anybody that tries to destroy what we build collectively is our enemy. Anybody that tries to say what Abdul has done with his own hands and the hands of his brother to try to destroy that becomes our enemy. Our job is to support the brother, surround the brother, and give him the opportunity to teach other brothers so that we can all do it. We got this thing in our head that is not enough for all of us. We live in abundance. There's abundance all around us. We so busy dealing in scarcity, we can't see the abundance. There's so much stuff around us that we can have because we concentrating on the block and we gave them Port Authority. There's so much abundance out here. That's why I told these, these, these organizations and institutions to show up. I gave them the call. I gave them the call and said, I need you at the men's meeting. Not so they can hear me speak, but so they can see you. And if you let them leave without seeing you, then, then what I asked them to do will be in vain. I called them here to see you because there's so much abundance going on. So much of the Newark Public Schools budget is almost a billion dollars. The city of Newark's budget is six, seven hundred million dollars. If you add the housing authority's budget, there's hundreds and hundreds of more millions of dollars in that budget. And here you go, young brother on the corner of your block, hustling for $250, a brand new pair of sneakers and some change to go to the club so you can pop some bottles and gotta have people searching for you every day and every night when there's legal billions and billions of dollars flowing through your community every single day. Dr. the Port Authority is the largest, we got the largest shipping port in the nation a stone's throw from where you hang out on Elizabeth Avenue. The largest seaport in the nation. They do billions of dollars of product every day. Every day. There's millions and millions of dollars exchanging hands in the city of Newark. Newark is not a poor city. People want to convince you that you're poor so they could take what you got. Newark is not a poor city. I was talking to an elected official two days ago. He thought he was giving me a compliment. He said, I drove past Newark and it was clean. I said, well, what did you expect it to be? Because in his mind, he thinks Newark means dirty. That, that's in, in their mind. So uh, at the end of the day, 
They want us to wallow in our misery. I'm not miserable. They want us to be depressed. I'm not depressed. They want us to be sorry for living in the situation that we're in. I'm not sorry. They want us to think we're useless and hopeless, that we don't have anything, that there's no opportunity. Because when you walk around like that, you walk around here angry. I'm not angry. I used to be angry. Oppression makes a wise man mad, so I started off angry. I started off angry, and if you were angry still 20 years from when you first got angry, then you didn't have no growth at all. I started off angry, now I'm smarter. I started off angry, now I'm wise. It's, first, it's one thing to be upset about what somebody is doing to you, then there's a whole nother emotion to feel like I'm gonna prevent somebody from doing what it is they're doing to me. Then there's a whole nother emotion that says I'm gonna take care of myself so nobody can exploit me. Then there's a whole nother emotion that says I'm gonna build something so my kids can love me. I'm way past the angry emotion. I done dealt with that already. There's an African proverb that says if your building is on fire, you don't beat the time times. Meaning that you can't cuss your oppression out. You can't cuss imperialism out. You can't cuss your enemies out. You actually got to do something about it. If you're homeless, let's find a house. And if you don't have a house, let's try to build one. I was talking to a student who said, what are we going to do now that they ban black history from schools in, in, in certain parts of the country? I said, we're going to do what we always did. We're going to teach our own damn selves black history, and we'll teach our children black history, and we'll go to the church if we have to. We'll go to the community center if we have to. We'll do like Mary McLeod Bethune and sell sweet potato pies on the side of the road to build our own damn schools if we have to. We don't have to depend on people doing for us what we can do for our they should do it. We got a democratic right to have it, but if you don't want to do it, damn it, we can build it ourselves. We got our own mind, our own strength, our own resources to build it ourselves. That's the mindset where I'm in. We're not losers. We're not victims. That's not us. We're not targets. Walk around with our heads down, our lips poked out like somebody doing something to us. The people who doing it to you ain't apologized to you yet. You taking it out on your brothers out here, your sisters out here in this community and your real enemies get away scot-free. You out here protesting and acting a fool to folks in here and your real enemies get away scot-free. You don't never say anything to them because you don't got no courage to do that. I gotta pray every single day, every single day for patience, for patience to deal with the niggardliness. The selfishness that we've learned, the hatred that we have for one another, the vulnerability of my skin. That's how I talk. The my skin is vulnerable. That means that people can do to me what they don't do to other people. And I gotta take it, so I gotta pray before I leave out the house to have the strength to take abuse. Take abuse from people that I know. If the cameras wasn't knowing and we was in a room by our damn selves. so we can hold the line. Because in your mind, you know that the objective is to knock you off the square, to take you off the wall, to stop you from building, to make people see all the things that they call you true. So there are people who are probably talking about you, brother, right now, who saying you this, you that, you this. I'm sorry I keep talking, calling your name, brother, but I respect everything that's going on in New Direction. And, 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 and one hood, y'all brothers over there, there are people that are talking about you now. That are saying that you really this, you really that, you really this, you really that. And they're trying to find a way to show the world 
that what they're saying or the names that they're calling you is your right name. And you have to remember the name that you call yourself. That you're no longer Joe, you now Abdul. That you're not just Bill, you rock bomb. You understand what I'm saying? That you ain't that person, you somebody else. You've evolved and developed and become an example. And the way they stop you from influencing other people is by making you not an example anymore. They want to take the example away from them because if people see you, then they want to imitate you. If they imitate you, then our enemies are in trouble. Could you imagine? I tell the kids this, but what about the leaders? Could you imagine if we really was together? All of us, all of these organizations in here, if we really was together, could you imagine all of the blocks and the hoods? You know how y'all walk up, hoodie on, hat down, tight? You walk up like that, a group of you, it's 10 of y'all, they already nervous. 15, imagine if it was 250. Imagine if it was a thousand of you from every block in the city looking like that. Walk up into a Port Authority board meeting and sit down quietly together with no, with no dis disruption or discussion or foolishness, just sit down. And one person got up and said, we need jobs. In this community. We need business opportunity in this neighborhood. We need this now. Or are we gonna keep coming back down here? They're more afraid of that. They taught you that they were afraid of you being on the block. They're not afraid of you on the block because they ain't coming to your block. The only person that's afraid of you on your block is your own grandmother. They're not afraid of you on your block because they ain't never gonna be on your block. They're afraid of you on their block. And all of you guys that got business and opportunity and doing development in here, you need to be bringing it together so all of us can be a part of it. Bring, unite with each other, farm large LLCs. Tell these folks they ought to give you business. If you can't move debris in your neighborhood, who else can? If you can't put up cameras in your community, who else can? You can't sweep the hallways in your own community, that's a problem. I mean, the basic things we ought to get. And the basic things are paying people. Basic things, people are eating off the basic things. And, and, and we, as they make these decisions about What's going to happen in the state politics, the senator, the governor, all this other stuff they be talking about? They're not thinking about us. They're not thinking about us. They think about us when we start talking about affordable housing, maybe. You see how much they do, we do towards that. Think about us when we start talking about things that we got to give people. We don't want just affordable housing. We want contracts. Don't y'all want some contracts? Because guess what? If you have some contracts, then you won't need no affordable housing. We want some contracts. We, we want, we want a, those high paying jobs they got down at the port and all the other places like that. We want all of that. And we prepared to take them. And we got the guys that are ready to go in them. And if they don't come to work, let us deal with that. We'll take care of them and make sure they come to work every day, sir. They didn't have the, uh, the proper surrounding and upbringing to make sure they come to work. They're part of us now. They're going to be to work every day. And a matter of fact, we want them to go to work so much that they learn everything at the job so that they can leave that job and begin to do it for themselves. I'm not going to stay long. I know that's, that, that might sound incredible and impossible to a few of you. Y'all sitting there thinking about, look, I got so much to deal with. I can't think about owning this or creating this or having this or doing that. But it's got to be in your mind and your heart. Because even if you don't do it, you need to talk about it and exude it so that the people around you can do it. Like maybe your children can do it. Because sometimes you can't accomplish things, but you want to make a way so your child can do the things that you didn't have the ability to do. There are things that I want to do in my life that I can't do anymore. 
that, that my age and the time and the things that I've been through won't give me the opportunity to do. But I'm going to make sure that all of the things that I could not do, that little Jewel will be able to do it. I want to make sure that he can carry on what I had to leave behind. And you're going to leave some stuff behind. If you're doing what you're supposed to do, you ought to leave some stuff behind. And they ought to pick it up and carry it along. And that's really what you want. You want them to carry it along. In order for people to know your name, you got to have a legacy. The problem is we want people to know our name for the wrong reasons. We're trying to be seen. We, we, that's why we got the cameras up, because we want to be seen. We go around here, we want to go viral on the internet, so we want to be seen. You're going to be seen for a month, for a week, but I want to be seen because my son, when I'm no longer here, is seen, and he's carrying my name, so when they see him, they see me. And when they see his sons, they see him, and he sees me. That they see me, that my legacy goes through generations, because what I gave him, he gives to somebody else, and they give to somebody else, and they give to somebody else. The businesses that I own, the home that you provide, the intelligence, the information that you give them passes on from generation to generation to generation. How are you going to be remembered? Wow. You mean the only way your son is going to know you is because you came to a couple of council meetings and disrupted a few council meetings? That's your legacy? Because you yelled loud outside with a damn camera? You can't feed your own family. How are they going to remember you? You got to change that. I don't care if you did 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. That, they, they put that on you. You home now. Let's figure it out. And guess what? Let's figure it out together. Let's figure it out. Let's make sure that those who were on the battlefield, right? Because that's a battlefield out there, as was pointed out, and, and, and had to be taken away. When they come home, they come home to something. That's what you can do. Build something so when other people come home, that they don't come home to what you came home to. So when they come home, they come home to something you built. And they can say, damn, this was created, and these people created it, that's my legacy. These are the legacy, these are the things that I'm leaving behind. And all of us can do that, and we can do it together. And if you by yourself, that's the problem. You gotta get with somebody. You gotta get with somebody. All of us gotta get with somebody. I just thank God for giving me the courage to say what I want to say when I want to say it. That's it. No matter who in the room, no matter who's around, I, I don't scratch where I don't inch, I don't dance when there's no music playing. And I'm not going to apologize for anything that I did or anything that I said. And I don't care if you like it or not like it because I'm not doing it for you to like it. I'm doing it because it's right, because I feel like it's right, because I know that, what, what's, that we're going to be rewarded for the good works that we do. I know that. I don't care how many times you protest, how many times you come out, how many times you do whatever, we're going to build and stay on this wall. We're going to stay on this wall because we're feeding people, because we're clothing people, because we're building something, because we're creating an army, because we're creating businesses, because we're creating opportunity, because we're bringing people up, because we're snatching people out of the grave and standing them on their own two feet because we're putting a master grip on people in a shallow grave and standing them on their own two feet so they can walk on their own. We're putting information in people's heads, encouraging their heart, and they begin to do things they never did before and go in places they never been before and talk to people they never talked to before and do things that their community looking at them sideways for because now they got the power and the courage to do something that everybody else refuses to do. And if I like something in you, to make you go out there and bust a brick, that's exactly what I want to do. If I light some menu to make you want to go buy the whole block up and employ all your homies, that's what I want to do. If I light something in you to put the drug down, to put the alcohol down, to figure out how to empower yourself and empower your community, that's what I want to do. That's, if I do that, then I already won. I was the mayor when I was born. Ma, you want to be the, I was the mayor already, you just didn't know it. I was born the mayor. And if God want me to be the governor, damn it, then I'll be that too. This ain't no announcement. I'm telling you I ain't afraid. 
I don't care how the stuff you bring to me, all the foolishness that you create, all the drama that's gonna come with it, all the rumors and dumb stuff that's gonna pop up. I ain't afraid. I ain't afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm from Newark, New Jersey. I done seen things that most people ain't seen. Things that happened to me that didn't happen to most other people. I ain't afraid. I'm not scared. I ain't never been scared. I've been more scared on Avon and 14th at 12 o'clock at night than I'm scared of you. I've been more scared in, in front of Yousef Steak and Take walking home at 1 o'clock in the morning. I'm more scared of my mama knowing I was out past the damn street lights than I am scared of you. I'm not afraid. And I'm telling you this because I know you shouldn't be afraid. Your enemies are plentiful and bountiful. They're going to come at you. But don't be afraid. Open your business. Build the store. Create opportunity for yourself and your community. Ask these people for contracts. Demand contracts. Get your paperwork together. Get your, all of your business licenses like your brother said here. Put it all together. Then go there and get what you're supposed to get. This stuff is for you. It's yours. It was for you before you came out your mother's womb. It was created. The abundance is yours. It belongs to you. You just don't know it. That's why you let other people take it. All of it is yours. The whole city is yours. The planet is yours. Every 196,940,000 square miles of the planet Earth belongs to you. All of it is yours. Every last bit of it is yours. The street sign, the houses on the, the corner stores, all of it is yours. Everything belongs to you. They can't eat without you. They feed their kids with you. They populate the jails because of you. There are people who got jobs because you won't stop going back there. All of this stuff is because of you. All you got to do is recognize it. When you recognize it, then you begin to take the steps to take it. You take the steps to take it. I appreciate Charlemagne the God for coming here. He didn't have to do that. He's got a business in the city too that he's starting, a business here. We appreciate his company amongst us. Yes, sir. We appreciate him. We not starstruck. That's right. That's right. Gentlemen. That's right. But we appreciate the brother. We appreciate his work. We appreciate the words and the wisdom that he's given us and we taking it because we eat good food. We appreciate that. We not starstruck. We love the brother because the brother is successful. And we should never hate on him because he's successful. We should be happy that he's, he's successful yes, and look at his success as part and parcel of our own success and think that if he could do it, so could I, right? So when you see the brother, you see yourself. You see yourself in his success so you're not hating on him because you know how we get. We get upset when we see other people in rising because we think we stuck. We not stuck. Remember, I told you your enemy's job is to weaken you not destroy you and part of weakening you make you believe that you're always going to be where you are and ain't nothing you're going to be able to do about it you're always going to be in this situation there's nothing you're going to be able to do about it i'm around people they don't want nothing i don't want nothing we ain't never going to have nothing i'm always going to be on this block it's always going to be all like that's your enemy talking that's not you talking that's your enemy talking i'm always going to be high this is why i'm a hope to die dope thing no that's your enemy talking we always gonna be poor. No, that's your enemy talking. It's fighting us. We always that's we against that hood. We always gonna be beefing. That's your enemy talking. You don't have to always be beefing. That's your enemy talking. We always gonna be opposed to one another. That's your enemy talking. We can't get together. That's your enemy talking. Don't let him dominate the conversation. That's your enemy talking. I don't know why I'm helping these guys. They don't want to help my help anyway. I'm going to just stop doing all this. That's your enemy talking. Because that's your enemy. That's what he wants you to do. Stop doing all this anyway. That's your enemy talking. I started the business. I go down to City Hall. They keep giving me the run around. I can't get this. I can't get that. I'm going to give up. I'm going to get on the internet now and talk crazy about everybody because I can't get what I need to get. That's your enemy talking. That's your enemy. Your enemy said you went down there three times, they ain't gonna do shit for you. <laughs> That's your enemy talking. Don't go back down there not knowing the fifth time you go is where your blessing is at. That, that he was waiting for you to go the fifth time. 
but you gave up on the third time. You didn't even get to the fourth time. And your enemies know that the fifth time is the blessing time. So at that third time, be like, don't go back down there. They ain't going to do shit to you. They just talking. Da, 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 da. And you say, I ain't going back down there. You get your phone. I went down there three times. And da, 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 they ain't doing that with nobody. That's your enemy talking. That's your enemy talking. And sometimes you watch those videos and listen, and your enemy is on that video. Your enemy is on that video telling you not to improve yourself. I'm done. Y'all beautiful on purpose. God made you beautiful on purpose. You look good on purpose. Everything we wear look good. Your nose is fat on purpose. When I had hair, it was kinky on purpose. That's how I look. My skin looked this way on purpose. God made me like this for real, on purpose. Beautifully made. I was born and created in the perfect way. I'm beautiful. You guys are beautiful, outstanding. Even with your weaknesses and hardships, on your worst day, you look good. On your worst day, you look good. And they couldn't stack things up you if you decided to do what's right one day. Everybody is in trouble. Everybody in trouble. How they get mathematics if it wasn't for you? Where the philosophy come from? Language and alphabet and travel. And where did it come from on your worst day? You look good. Imagine if you said today I'm going to be the best that I could be. I'm going to be the person God made me to be and I'm going to unite with my brothers and they're going to be the best that they can be. Could you imagine 150 of us at our best? They can't deal with me at my worst. On mediocre days when I have bad nights and I wake up too early and I come in, I still can handle them, my enemies. I still can deal with them. They can't handle me on my best day. I know they can't handle me on my best day. They can't keep me inside. You can't keep me off the block. You can't keep me out the neighborhood. You can't keep me from talking to people. I'm going to go where I want to go. Talk to who I want to talk to. Say what I want to say. I'm going to go to the block and I can go to Trenton. I can walk on Avon Avenue and I can walk in the state house. I can get invited to the White House and hang around the damn crack house. God made me that way. I could talk to the Vice President of the United States and talk to old boy on the block and have a same conversation in different languages. God made me this way. And I'm going to tell you a secret. He didn't just make me this way. He made y'all that way too. He made you like this, on purpose. Now go out there and get some stuff done. Go out there and turn this thing upside down. When we walk in the room, let people know you're there. And you don't got to open your mouth, because when you're in your true self, when you walk in the room, they're going to stop anyway. They can start whispering. They're going to stop whispering. Their head going to pop up when you walk in. Stop being a clown. You ain't no clown or a fool. You don't juggle or tap dance. You don't entertain people. When you walk in the room, they stop doing what they're doing. They was making contracts. Now they have to include you. You go to tables that you weren't invited in. That's what you're supposed to do, all of you. All of you. And if you do that, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. You do that, I'm with you. That's it. If you do that, you got me. Period. I'm going to stand with you. I don't care what you've been through, where you're where you from, what's going on with you. I'm going to stand with you. I'm going to stand with you. And whatever I got, I'm going to make sure you have. And I'm going to stand with you because that's my job and my duty as a civilized person to civilize the uncivilized. And, and to make sure that whatever blessing that I got belongs to you. Whatever blessing I got is your blessing. And I'm holding the line. I hope y'all holding the line with me. 
When I hear somebody talking about you, I'm stepping in. I ain't gonna let, no, ain't gonna let nobody defame your name or your character or tell lies about things that I know you didn't do. I'm stepping in. I'm gonna defend you. I'd rather die defending you than die doing something dumb on the street. I'd rather die defending my people in the truth than die doing something crazy and stupid out here. I'm going to defend you with my life. That's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to let nobody hurt you or harm you or talk terrible about you. I'm going to step up to the plate. I don't care who they are, how big they are, how ugly they sound, or how rough they look. I'm going to step, step up to the plate or how much power they think they have. Because the power that I have is greater than any power that exists on this planet. I'm not afraid of it. So that's what hold the line mean. Hold the line mean I know my name. And I'm not going to undermine you or backdoor you or betray you or turn on you or turn cold on you. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to put your name down to make myself look big. Or because I'm in a room with people who don't like you, I'm going to not like you too. You know how that go. You go in a room and people talking about that person. You want to be with them people. So you start talking about that person too. That's not me. I'm not doing that. I'm going to say, hold up, brother. That's my brother. Y'all can't talk like that while I'm in here. Y'all got to have that conversation when I leave. You can't have it while I'm here. I respect your feelings, but those are not my feelings. I know the brother. That's what I'm going to say. And when people say, oh, he did this, he did that, he did this, I'm going to say, yeah, but now he's doing this. And I'm with him. That's what I, that's holding the line. Somebody offer me some money to cut you out. I'm going to say no. All money ain't good money. I'll give you 10,000 extra dollars. I just want to talk to you. I don't want to talk to them. Those guys are a little rough. I'm going to say, well, you can't talk to me if you don't want to talk to them because we all together. All you got to do is be quiet and sit down in the back and don't say nothing. We're going to take care of you. You got two jobs. We're going to take care of your, your wife, your kids, all that. Hey, good. Just let us destroy these people. No. That can't work. That can't work because I believe in who I am and whatever you give me, I can give myself. So I don't have to depend on you to do anything for me. And I want to say something to all those guys that came here with the cameras and acting crazy and foolish and dumb. Your brothers are in here. These are people who've been through hell and back. Some of them been through hell and back two and three times. They're trying to find a way to get out of hell. Figure a way to do something for themselves and give them business and opportunity and camaraderie and love with each other. You ought to put that stuff down and come in here and sit with us. Stop listening to your enemies. Stop following your enemies and come in here and be with your brothers because they love you and they want to be with you. But we ain't going to stop what we're doing because of your ignorance. We're going to go forward anyway and anything that gets in the way has to be rolled over. Because our future is more important than our past. And our present is more powerful than our mistakes. And our God protects us. My security get upset because sometimes I want to do things alone. I walk away, I tell them move aside. Da, 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 da. They want to rest with me and throw me in the car and all this other kind of stuff. And you can't go out there, you got to go back here, sit down. Uh, they, that's what they want to do to me. And sometimes I got to apologize to them and because sometimes I lose myself, right? Uh, because I know what God made and I know what I'm becoming and I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid, and sometimes that's dangerous not to be afraid. I'm, I'm not afraid, and I'm not afraid because I'm a tough guy. I'm not not afraid because I'm a gangster. I'm not afraid because God is in me. 
and I could go anywhere I want to go. I can walk anywhere I want to walk. I'm not afraid because, I, you know, I, I got a, a gun on my hip or, you know, I, I got homies that's going to do whatever. That's, I'm not afraid because I got the truth. That's why I'm not afraid. And if I died outside trying to get you guys together, then that's a noble death. Hold the line. 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 Give the man thunderous round of applause. Thank you, we love you. We appreciate you. Now it's time to close out, intervene, and talk to your brother.